Thank you so much. Great, thanks. Great to be here. So can you hear me up the back okay? Good, okay. So today I want to share with you what I have figured out is one of the, well, it is the most infallible secret of success. And as I do it, I'm going to be talking in stories. And uh, I also have four mantras that, that I've lived my life by for the, you know, 25, 30 years now. I wrote these four statements out on a piece of paper and put them in the front of my daily planner at least 25 years ago, and I carry it forward every year since. It's these four statements. So, um, so I'm going to, uh, as I mentioned, talk in, in story form because I find that's, that's really effective. And I'm just going to check my, my clicker so we don't run into the same problems we had before. OK, we're in business. So when I was in my mid-20s, I was an accountant in Perth, Australia. I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do with my life. I knew I didn't want to be an accountant. And I was at a party once, and there was a buddy of mine who had a little yacht manufacturing company, and I really admired him because he totally was at peace with himself, and he knew he was doing what he loved, and he was being really successful. And I said, hey, Rich, how do you know what to do with your life? How do you know... What, what path to follow? And he thought about it for a while. And he came back to me and he said, Brian, figure out what you can do better than anybody else and then do it because you cannot help but be successful. Right? That went over my head. I had no idea what I was better than anybody else at. And so I went on the next four or five years living my life as an accountant. In, uh, in Perth. So the first story that, that sort of relates to that is, is um, it goes along with my first mantra, which is feast upon uncertainty. Okay? So I heard a story recently and it reminded me of that conversation I had with my friend Rich. It was about a guy who was going to this book club every Friday night and the leader of the club would say, well, what do you want to write about? Oh, I don't know. And next Friday night, what do you want to write about? God, I don't know. I really don't know. And after a few weeks, the, the leader of the group just got so sick of it. As they were leaving, he, he reached down, he picked up a piece of tile from the ground and said, OK, next Friday night, two pages on this piece of broken tile. So, you know, I probably would have quit the book club, but this guy <laughs> rallied to the challenge and, and he decided, okay, where's it made? So he found out that tiles are made in a precast concrete plant. So he went to the one right next to his uh, area in the city and he took this tile and said, did you make this tile? And the, the, the foreman looks at it and goes, no, this is made by the factory on the other side of town. And the guy, are you kidding? You can tell that? And he says, yeah, look at the glazing and the sand they've used and the coloration. That's definitely the factory over there. So this guy was taken aback and, and so he arranged for a meeting to go over and, and visit the plant manager at that plant and he was given a tour of all of the gravel pits that, that you know, were delivered and the silos of fly ash and cement and he was taken up into the batching system where all the conveyor belts dump all this stuff in and mix it up and the, the waters and the additives and then it goes out to the moulds and eventually it comes out like like a piece of tile, right? And so next Friday night, he didn't do two pages. He had a complete chapter on the making of tiles. But he didn't stop there. He was so into this, this tile business that he started going to libraries and bringing out books on tiles. And he started going to museums and he was looking at, at different museums all across the world. And he, you know, he found tiles from... Uh, India and, and Babylonia and all of these just these ancient tiles from, from Greece and the Roman baths and he amassed so much information that he became like the world expert on tiles and guess what? He published a book. Okay? And when I heard this story I went, oh my God, here's a guy that went from nothing and became the best at what he did and he's successful. He's the only one that published a book out of that entire book club. Right? 
So, so why am I telling you this, okay? This, this is uh, a random story, but I'm going to weave it in through stories of UG that, that uh, I have uh, lived through, and you're going to see by the end the relevance of how this works. So the next uh, story is I, I want you to come back with me to 1979 in Australia, okay? I'm... An accountant, as I said, hated it, and I finally graduated after 10 years, and I quit the same day. And I was just drifting around for a couple of weeks, figuring what, what will I do, and I just happened to have bought a new record and uh, flipped off the cover and put it on, and the words of the second song was uh, it, from my favorite album, <laughs> Dark Side of the Moon was tired of lying in the sunshine, staying home to watch the rain. You are young and life is long and there is time to kill today. I thought, oh shit, he's talking to me. <laughs> but then one day you find 10 years have got behind you. No one told you when to run. You missed the starting gun. And I stopped down and just got covered in goosebumps. And I thought, oh my God, I've been running on the spot for 10 years. All my buddies that started accounting with me, they're all tracking off to partnerships and other friends who didn't go to college but they started their own businesses, they were doing really well. And here I was just dead in the water, running on the spot. So I just discovered yoga and meditation at that time and I was sitting around meditating and thinking, okay, what can I do and what can I do? And suddenly I got these goosebumps all over my body again and I thought all the big trends are coming out of California. Levi jeans, waterbeds, you know, all the surf brands. I said, I'm going to go to California, I'm going to find the next big trend and I'm going to bring it back to Australia and be a multi-millionaire. Right? So within weeks I arrived at Los Angeles airport, I had my surfboard and my suitcase and I rented a place in Malibu and, uh, sorry, I, the house was in Santa Monica, but I wanted to surf Malibu, it had always been my dream. So I headed off and spent the first month up in Malibu, made a ton of friends, didn't find the next big thing. So I surfed another month at Malibu, made a bunch more friends, still didn't find the next big thing. And then it was in the third month that I, my buddy was down from the valley and we were going to go surfing again and he brought down the latest issue of Surfer magazine and I was just flipping through it. Bam, I stopped again and I just got this massive dose of goosebumps again. And here was a photograph of a pair of sheepskin boots in front of a fireplace and I thought, oh my God, there's no sheepskin boots in America. And back home, one in two people had some sort of sheepskin footwear. So I decided, hey, Doug, hey, buddy, we're going to go into business, man. We are really going to be rich fast. <laughs> We've all heard that. <laughs> so we, uh, we called up the guy who'd run the ad. Uh, he was a little factory in, in Western Australia. His name was George Bircher from Country Leather. And we called him up and to you know, cut a long story short, we got to be the dis you know, a deal to be distributors. So we, we sort of put together 500 bucks and sent it down for six pairs of samples. And they arrived and uh, this is what they looked like. Whoop. Pretty crude, you know, that yellow stain on the front is glue and uh, there's glue all around the soles and there's no binding on the back, there's no binding at the top. It's just two pieces of sheepskin, you know, stitched together and, and you know, glued onto a piece of, you know, laminate sole. And, but anyway, this was the state of the art of boots back then. So Doug was going to be the salesman. I was terrified. So he took all the samples and he went around all of Southern California and came back two weeks later and he had a manila envelope with a probably 150 business cards of every single shoe retailer that he'd seen and not a single order. And he says, Brian, they, they said we're crazy trying to sell sheepskin in California. And I understand intellectually that, that they could think that because they didn't understand how sheepskin works. 
But it wasn't right because Australia's climate is identical to California. And so we had to think, you're like any entrepreneur, when you hit a wall, you got two choices, give up or pivot, right? So we pivoted and thought, okay, well, how come all my buddies at Malibu think this is the best idea in the world? And it struck me, they all surfed, They'd, most of them had been to Australia and had bought four or five pairs of these boots back for their buddies. So within the surfing community, it was pretty well known. So Doug and I pivoted and we said, okay, let's go after the surf shops. So he took off up to the valley and I, you know, overcame my, my horror of selling and, and took the samples and I started off in Santa Monica and went down the beach areas. And the first store I walked into, I was super nervous and really timid and I opened up the bag and, and the guy goes, oh, Ugg boots, man, they're fantastic. What are you doing with them? I said, well, we're thinking of importing them into America. Oh, you are going to do fantastic. They're the best. I got a pair. Buddy bought them back for me. And next store I went to was, oh, Ugg boots. Yeah, my buddies have all got those. They swear by them, you know. And I'm thinking, well, this selling's not too bad, you know. <laughs> I, as I got further and further down through Newport and Laguna Beach and all the way down to San Diego, I'm like becoming bulletproof, you know. I've got the best product in the world. And so Doug and I met back in our, in our little, uh, you know, office in Santa Monica in the, you know, my house and, and he got the same reaction from all the surf shops he'd visited. And uh, it never struck us that we hadn't asked for an order. <laughs> because why should we? We didn't have any inventory, right? So, but we knew that we were going to be instant millionaires because of all of this demand that was out there. So we decided, okay, we need capital. Now, who's ever heard that saying that once you start out on a path, the universe will conspire to work with you? Put, put your hands up. Look, look at that. It's a very ancient saying. It's been around forever. It's very, very true. And my roommate overheard me and said, hey, there's some guys at my office are looking to invest in things and maybe I can talk to them. And so just like that, without a business plan or, or you know, anything, we just raised 20,000 bucks and sent 15,000 down to the factory at George and, and ordered 500 pairs, waited for them to come in, and uh, finally they arrived. And we loaded up. Well, first of all, we had to bring them all into the third bedroom of my house in Santa Monica, which is now the international headquarters of UGG. And uh, we sort of floored a ceiling in all the different colours and sizes and stuff. And we, Doug and I filled up our cars and we headed off. So he took the valley and I go back to the very first same guy and, and I walk in. This time I got a huge bag and I got an order pad, right? And I walk in and, you know, and I said, hey, how many do you want? And he goes, oh, Brian, well done. But, you know, we couldn't sell them out of our store. We just sell surfboards and trunks and flip-flops and, and we couldn't sell them here. Uh-oh. And off to the next store. Well done, Brian. You know, but we sell surfboards and bikinis and trunks and flip-flops and sandals. And, you know, you should go to the shoe stores. You'll make a fortune. Uh-oh. And this happened over and over through Newport, Laguna, all the way through San Diego. And when we met back in our little headquarters in Santa Monica a week later, we tallied up the orders. And you're not going to believe what the first year's sales of UGG was. 28 pairs. It just happened to be exactly $1,000. And so that should be, well, it was pretty devastating, right? But as I went through life and built, kept building this business, it, it became a theme of, of, of every business that I started and all the friends' businesses I was looking at. And when I eventually sat down to write the book, it became the theme, which is, uh, the book, by the way, is called The Birth of a Brand. And there'll be a slide up later. You can get that from Amazon. But uh, the theme of the book is you can't give birth to adults, right? Every business, every sitcom on TV, every sandwich shop, every new tech business, someone conceives the idea 
and then they take the first action and that's the birth. You know, for me and Doug, buying those samples was the birth of UG. And then it just goes into an infancy and it lies there and it lies there and it lies there and it, no amount of feeding or no amount of shaking the cradle or no amount of urging is going to get this baby to get up and go to college. It has to be an infant. And it'll give a giggle now and then, you know, but it's all feeding, change diapers, feeding. And, uh, but eventually, this infant starts to toddle, right? And it's inevitable that if you stick with it, you don't give up, because most entrepreneurs give up during that period. They think it's failing. It's really not. It's incubating. So if you can hang in through that, that really, really tough period where you think your idea is not going to get traction, it'll start to toddle. And that's a cool phase because the first customers are buying it and people are writing articles about it and, and you know, all, all your customers are spreading the word through their groups. That's a real exciting phase. And that'll eventually hit into youth where you've got consistent orders coming in, the production's great, the accounting and billing's fine, the customer service is perfect. And you can run a business you know, from a million to $20 million in that youth phase. But if it's a really, really cool business, like a really cool service or a really cool product, you're going to hit the teenage years. And you've all been there, right? You want to be at every party in town and you want to burn the candle at both ends. And, and that's a really, really scary part for any business because you want to be at trade shows you can't afford, on the other part of the country you can't you know, really service. And a lot of people fall into the trap of thinking bigness fast is going to be success. And in fact, I almost lost UG twice during that period. So, so let's move on to what I call the tadpole era. And the, 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 the mantra that goes with this is, is fatten upon disappointment, right? We already had feast upon uncertainty. Now it's fatten upon disappointment. So that would have been a great time to give up. Sales of 28 pairs. But, but I couldn't because I had all my investors' money tied up in the inventory. And I had to get rid of them somehow. So Doug got another job and I just started going to swap meets and street fairs and believe it or not, the, my best retail venue was the back of my van at Malibu Beach because I had such a word of mouth from people coming every single day. Even if the surf was crappy, I'd still go there and open the van up and I had a huge business going. And so the trouble was that after that first year, the sales were about $10,000. So... I figured, okay, next year I'm going to get smart, I'm going to advertise. So we hired a couple of models, really good looking guy and girl, and we posed them on the beach with a you know, photographer and had the perfect hair and perfect clothes and the perfect boots in the, in the front and middle of the, of the ad and uh, ran the ads that, that fall and the sales went to like $15,000. And I couldn't figure out why, it should have been much more. So the next season, we got better looking models, more expensive photographer and put them on the beach with the perfect hair and perfect clothes and the boots, you know, big white boots right front and centre of the ads. And we ran them and, and the sales went to about $25,000. And I couldn't figure out what I'm doing wrong. Until I was having a beer with one of my surf shop owners in Ocean Beach there. And uh, I said, Rob, you know, this is a problem I have. And he goes, oh, shut up, Brian. And he calls out the back to all these little grommets, you know, 12, 13-year-old kids. He says, hey, guys, come out here. And he says, what do you think of Ugg boots? And every one of them just walked out and goes, oh, those Uggs, man, they're so fake. Have you seen their ads? Those models, they can't surf. Instantly, I knew I'm sending the wrong message to my target market. Horrible. And, I, and the, the worst part is I instantly got it. And I realised, oh, oh, shit, I've just been doing this for three years. And so, so the, next, 
day, again, I pivoted and I called up a buddy of mine. He was running the National Scholastic Surf Association. And I said, hey, Pete, you got any young kids who are who, you know, going to turn pro? Because I haven't got any money. I can't really pay them except in boots. And so he gave me two guys, Mike Parsons and Ted Robinson. They were young, 16-year-old kids, great surfers. And so instead of hiring an expensive photographer, I just had my little Canon Sure Shot. And we just went surfing. And we went to Black's Beach in La Jolla. And we also went up to... Uh, San Onofre, that's trestles on the right there. And each one of these walks is about a mile. You know, Blacks is downhill, the other one's flat. And every little kid who reads Surfer magazine would die to be on that walk with Mike Parsons and Ted Robinson. It was so passionate. And this was the beginning of me learning and understanding marketing, which went on to become my, my passion in, every, in the whole UG business. And the interesting thing is here, look how big the Ugg boots are in those ads, right? They're almost invisible. And there's a huge lesson in here. You don't advertise your product like a photo of your product. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's software and it saves time. Put a photo of some guy in the Bahamas drinking a rum drink or something because of all the time he's saving, right? You always advertise the benefits and the benefit for Ugg here was, oh, shit, I wish I was in that ad. I wish I was at Trestles. You know, I wish I was with my passes. And that's the emotional drive that you've got to try and find in all of your advertising as to what, what, are you, what basic need are you hitting with your potential customer. So the... Uh, Interesting thing is when I started running those ads, the sales went to $200,000, right? I mean, instantly. And that's why I call it the tadpole story. Nearly always, the quickest way for a tadpole to become a frog is live every day happily as a tadpole. So I was like tadpoling it through all of those years, not quite hitting the mark. And there's two other stories that, that were similar to mine. One was this company up in Oregon, and they were bringing in these running shoes called Blue Ribbon from uh, Japan. And they'd been going after the athletic market in, in you know, running magazines across the country and athletic departments in, in colleges. And they were advertising these new running shoes. And, and five or six years they were doing this. And then suddenly the sport of of jogging took off in the, in the very early 80s. And it was right as this company changed its name to Nike. And they, because they were perceived to be the best at that time, they just got sucked into this vortex of, of filling the jogging need. And that was the beginning of them becoming a multi, multi million and eventually a billion dollar company. And around about the same time, because this was right as I was starting UGG, that there was another company in Santa Monica and they had these little white kid leather dance shoes and they were advertising to the dance studios all across the nation and they were also going out after the cheerleaders in the athletic departments throughout all the colleges. And then guess what? The sport of aerobics takes off. And so everyone who wants to get the lightest, you know, cutest shoe, they all go for this company. It's called Reebok, right? And Reebok, why, they, why Reebok? They were, the le they were the leaders at that time. They'd been a tadpole, 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 tadpole. Suddenly the market changed and now they're a frog, you know. Hundreds of millions of dollars, eventually a billion dollar company as well. So that, that uh, theme is, is uh, very universal. So the third mantra I have is invigorate in the presence of difficulties, right? Feast upon uncertainty. Fatten upon disappointment, invigorate in the presence of difficulties. So let's fast forward maybe six years. Uh, we're doing two and a half million dollars in sales. And remember that first $20,000 investment we got? You know, I thought we'd never need any more money than that. Well, we had to buy that investor out, bring a bigger one in. But then we had to buy them out, bring a bigger one in. And now I'm at the stage of having to bring in another group of investors. And this time it's three guys. There's Neil, Paul, and Joe. They're up in Anaheim. 
and we're going to share the company 25% each. So we did the deal and uh, we moved all the inventory up to Anaheim and I spent a weekend organising all the product in the right shelves and everything in like a brand new warehouse. And uh, the deal was that I would get 20, we all get 25%, but I didn't get my 25% stock issued until I finished this little trademark lawsuit that I was having with a company called UGHS. But I knew I'd beat them, so we went ahead with the deal. So we finished setting up the warehouse, and I decided to go on the road from Anaheim and headed down Beach Boulevard to Huntington Surf and Sport. And this is on my first day under the new you know, deal where I was now the Southern California sales rep for the company and I was now getting commissions, right? So the very first door I walked into was uh, Huntington Surf and Sport and Steve goes, hey, Brian, I heard you sold the company. I said, what? He said, yeah, I called an order in this morning and they said you don't own the company anymore. I said, you're kidding me, they said that? And I couldn't wait to get out of there. And I, I went across to the Shell gas station next door and called up Neil at the, at the warehouse. And I go, Neil, what the hell are you telling people? He says, what do you mean? I said, well, they, they said that, you know, you're telling them I've sold the company. He says, well, yeah, that's the truth. And I said, no, it's not. You're my three new partners. I'm still the company. Well, you know, technically, Brian, you don't have any stock. And my world just crashed. Because I'd seen myself as a CEO of this big international, you know, sheepskin boot company one day. And here I am, I don't even own any of it. I, I drove straight back to San Diego and I pulled out the contract and I read it and I reread it and I went, shit, I don't own the company. And I went into this depression that lasted about three days. I just moped about. I had no enthusiasm to do anything. I just basically ate and slept. And it was the third night, I remember, I was lying on my back on the floor in the living room. My wife was sitting up on the couch. And the show finished on TV. I remember clicking it off. And then I rolled over on my stomach and I got up on all fours and I started crawling to the bedroom. And Laura, my wife, God bless her, she's a really, really quiet person. She just looked at me and said, you get up now and walk to bed like a man. <laughs> and it scared the shit out of me, you know. <laughs> so I was, I was down like this and it was like, I, I stood up and it was like coming out of a fog. And I thought, oh my God, there's so much more to life than this crappy little sheepskin company. And I slept like a baby that night. And the next day I got back into meditating again and I thought, okay, what will I do? Can I be a real estate? No. Business broker? Maybe. Accountant? Never. And then, and then I got this goosebumps again. And, and I'm going to segue now. Who, who in this room has experienced goosebumps? Put your hands up. Like I, I don't even need to ask it. Everybody has, right? This is what I believe it is. You know, God, God isn't way the heck out there in the heaven somewhere. I think there's a spark or a fragment of God in every single one of us. And it has some sort of plan on how it wants our life to evolve. And every time we make a decision that's in alignment with that plan, it says, good on you, mate. And, and the only way it can send that signal is through this electrochemical, you know, thing we call a body. And it gives us that little charge. And so... I would ask you all, next time you get goosebumps, just have a little think and say, wow, did I just make a, a sort of a life-changing decision then or a momentous decision or a courageous decision? And I'll bet you the answer will be yes. So, so why did I get these goosebumps? I thought, I've come to love selling. Then I thought, what can I sell? Ugg boots. I love Ugg boots. And so I went back to Anaheim and I ate humble pie and I told the guys, look, I may never own this company, but I am going to do my best to get a pair of Ugg boots on everybody's foot in America. 
And so that began me back going on the road again. And they agreed not to tell people that we'd sold the company because I wanted to be, you know, seen to be part of it, which was fine. And so over the next, you know, month, I was out there working with all the reps and, and I got uh, with all the uh, customers and got back and, and Neil hands me a, a, an envelope and I open it up, it's a check for 5,000 bucks. And he says, that's your commissions for the month. Uh, that's the first money I'd ever drawn out of the company. And I got back the next month, and I'm having a ball on the road with all my customers, you know, it's not even work. I get, there's a check for $10,000, and the next month another check for $10,000. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm having such a good time out here, but I've never made so much money. And, and this led me to a, another piece of philosophy which is nearly always your most disappointing disappointments will become your greatest blessings. And I've got so blasé that this, this is such a law of the universe that I really don't care anymore when disasters happen. I, I almost say, ha, ah, bring it on, you know. That's good. Now, what's good about it? And you'll be amazed, in, in fact, I'll turn it on you. How many of you in the last 12 months have had something happen in your personal life or your business where you thought at the time, this is the biggest disaster ever, and now you look back and think, thank God that happened. Look, everybody, look at this, more than, more than half the room. It's almost infallible that when you get a chance to sit back and go, okay, what's good about this? It's usually 24 hours, 48 hours. You'll figure out something, some way around it, that a month later you'll go, thank God that happened. So let's uh, fast forward again. And I'm going to give you my fourth mantra now, which is enthuse over apparent defeat. And you don't need, if you've written them down, that's great, but I've got them all here on a card and I've got enough cards for everybody on the back table before you go out. So please go and get one of these cards. It, 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 these four mantras, I, I've had people come up to me uh, after conferences a year ago and say, oh my God, that's been on my refrigerator and it's saved me over and over again. So it's quite a valuable piece of philosophy. So anyway, we're going to fast forward now. We're, 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 we're doing about, about 10 years. We're doing about 6 million in sales. I'm still with with Neil, however, he's already bought Paul and Joe out. So it's now me on the road who owns nothing and Neil who owns 100%. But we're getting on really great because I'm working great on the road. I've got about 30 sales reps across the country. I'm traveling with them. And uh, he's doing great in the, in the warehouse, you know, making sure the payments are going out to George all the time on time. And... Uh, so he finally says, Brian, come on in, you know, let's get your 25% of the company issued. And I'm in heaven, right? So we, before that, we, we bought new company cars for each other and we bought uh, life insurance on each other. And the attorneys were coming in the following Wednesday to uh, sit down and actually issue all the stock do, and do, sign all the documents. And I was out at the weekend and my wife called me. And by now I've, I've got a cell phone which is the size of a brick with a big cord. You know, and uh, really sexy with an antenna on the top of the car so everybody knows you got one, you know. And uh, anyway, my wife's crying. I go, Laura, what's wrong? And she says, oh, Brian, you just can't get a break. Neil just died. And he beat at a motocross race and uh, had a massive heart attack and never recovered by the time he got to the hospital. So that put a damper on my weekend and so I called up his wife the next, you know, right, right there and I said, look, I'll be up tomorrow morning on Monday and we'll, we'll try and figure out where we're at. And the last call I made was to George Bircher down in Australia at the factory and uh, told him, and you know, there's a huge silence on the other end of the line, because I could just imagine his mind thinking of how many great payments he's just had over the last three years, and then he remembered back to when I was paying him. <laughs> <laughs> Which I always did 100%, but he never knew when it was coming, and most of the time I didn't know when it was coming either. 
Um, but, you know, he was uh, real silent and I, I, I just got a bad feeling right then. But anyway, the next day I went up to Anaheim and I worked on, on, uh, with Della and I figured out, look, I promise I'll, I'll just be a forensic accountant. I'll try and figure out where the company's at and we'll figure out. She, she had never been in the, in the warehouse uh, or the office, so she had, she had no idea. So I just volunteered to try and figure out where we were. And that began the, the longest six or seven months of my life. And I was driving up to Anaheim and back. That was like six hours a day of on the road. And then I finally got the train up Monday and came back Friday. And every Friday night I'd come home with a just horribly sore throat from being so run down. And, and I was just trying to figure out, you know, where the company was at. It didn't look real good. The computer system hadn't been brought online properly, so we didn't have any great accounting, and, and it was like having to backtrack and figure out who owed us money. It was just a, a nightmare of things. And, uh, but it was the best and worst of times at the same time, because the best time was with our 30 sales reps, we just introduced black and gray. We called it charcoal. And those two colours were just kicking butt all across the country. Sales reps were bringing in orders like in record numbers. And, and that was the best of the times, but the worst was I'd compile these orders and I'd send them down to George at the factory and go, George, you know, 5,000 pairs this week. It's fantastic, man. We're going to have a huge season. Have you started production? Oh, well, how are you going to pay me? And the next week, I'd be sending another 5,000 pairs down. George, having another great week. You know, have you got the black and the, the charcoal skins yet? Oh, I can't seem to find them on the market anywhere. You know? and, and I was sensing that these were just like bullshit answers. And, and, but I kept sending them down anyway. And it was May, June, July. And I knew we had to start shipping in September. And the big trade show was in, in the beginning of September. So by July, I figured, you know, he's not reliable. So I, I started sending a business plan around to, to raise money to, to go to other manufacturers. And the banks that I went to, go, ah, Uggs are fad. You know, we've been around 10 years. Uggs are fad, won't be around next year. You know, investment bankers, ah, oh, you know, it's too seasonal. Uggs are fad, won't be around. And so I was getting shut out by all traditional financing. And so I had to begin being lateral thinking, you know, who would be interested in bankrolling this? So I thought, okay, maybe my best customers. So I tried all them and they weren't interested. And then I thought, how about the tannery that supplies the sheepskin to the manufacturers? And I thought, that's a natural. So I researched who the best tannery was in Melbourne, sent the business plan down. He said, hey, come on down. We're going to do, a, yeah, we're gonna do millions. And so finally I was able to breathe with, with relief. So I flew down to Melbourne and we went to Medity's office and, and the minute I walked in I see this plaque on, on his desk that says, I reserve the right to change my mind. I, That's weird. I wonder what that means. Yeah. So anyway, the first day was all about how we're going to take on the world and we're gonna, he's going to supply sheepskins to all the, ta all the manufacturers. And the second day was, oh, Brian, it's a long way, America. You know, I don't really know you and, you know, I don't, I don't know how I can control you. And the next day was, don't worry, I figured it out. I've got a friend in, in California. He'll work with you. Everything's great. The next day was, well, the family thinks it's too risky. I, you know, we've decided to pull out, you know. And so the bottom line is I left Melbourne with no deal after a week. And I got back to Canberra, uh, back to uh, uh, San Diego, and my sales rep had said, Brian, yeah, there's, a, there's another company out here and they're selling sheepskin boots and they said they're going to put Ugg out of business. And I mean, that's the last thing I needed to hear. I, I, so I said, who are they? And she said, well, there's a company called Thunderwear. So I, I looked them up in the trade directory and, it, and it's, it's a windsurfing company and they make nylon gloves and booties. And I said, well, Oh, good luck to them. You know, I, I got bigger worries than them. And so I uh, decided, okay, we've got to go to the trade show. Even though I don't have any way of getting product, we've got to go to the trade show in the beginning of September. And, and I don't want to look like we're out of business yet. I, for some, there was something in the back of my head did not want to give up. Right? And so we went there and set up the booth 
and used all last year's product to, to lay out a, you know, in, in the displays. And then we finished and I thought, okay, now I wonder where those Thunderwear people are. So I looked up the directory and found them in the other side of the, of the convention centre. And So I walked all the way across and I, and I stopped about three booths short and I went, oh, shit. There's all my black charcoal, natural sand, all my product with a new label on them. And the label was... Thugs, which I thought was rather appropriate. <laughs> and right then I knew I'm dead. We're out of business. But I didn't tell the sales staff and I didn't tell any customers. I just said, let's go write orders. You know, we'll call them next week. I'd already made up my mind that we're going to have to call everybody and tell them to go buy the thugs, you know. But we wrote a quarter of a million dollars of sales at that, that show and it was the best sales show we ever had, uh, knowing that we couldn't deliver a single pair. So after three days, went home and you know, pulled the booth down and went, went back to San Diego and I said you know, to Laura, my wife, I said, you know, we, we're giving it a good shot, we, we, just, we just can't combat this. And uh, so on Monday I'm going to have the, all the staff start calling all the customers and switch them over to thugs. And the last call I made that night was to Gordon Jackson, who was the owner of the tannery. And I said, Gordon, thanks so much for all the time you put in on this, but, you know, George has done this to us, he's done an end round, run around us and, you know, we're not going to be able to stay alive, so... Thanks so much for all the effort you put in, but, you know, we're just going to have to close it down. And he was sad and we hung up. And Laura and I went to bed and about three o'clock in the morning the phone rings and it's, you know, hello, Brian, it's, it's Gordon. Screw George Bircher, I'll get you all the boots you need. And just like that we were back in business again. No handshake, no contract, no nothing. I sent the patents down the next day. He copied them and distributed them to four or five manufacturers and he churned the factory down, you know, the, the tannery up into full maximum production and started shipping skins every single day. And after about the first three weeks, we started getting the first pairs of boots coming in. They, they, were, they were not great quality, but they were sheepskin boots and they had UGG labels on the back, right? And, and then they fell into this pattern of 5,000 pairs every Friday. And our retailers got to know that they came in every Friday. And so rather than wait for UPS, they were driving to our, our warehouse, picking up as many boots as they could. They never ever got as much as they wanted, but they were off. And then the next Friday, we get another 5,000 pairs, clean Saturday. And next Friday, another 5,000 pairs, clean on Saturday. And this went on all the way through September, October, November, December. And even though we threw away over a million and a half dollars worth of orders at, at wholesale, that's about three million at retail, we were alive. And I didn't care. I, I didn't care how much we missed. We were alive. And then two things happened between Christmas and New Year. The first one was, remember I told you we took life insurance policies out on each other? The life insurance policy paid out on him and it was just enough money to buy his widow out of the entire business. So now I owned 100% of it again, <laughs> right? Who could believe that? Who could ever see that coming? And the other thing that happened was that the customs broker screwed up and shipped 2,000 pairs of, of thugs to me and 1,000 pairs of my Ugg boots to him. And I really wanted to destroy these things, but I knew I wanted my 1,000 pairs even more. So I arranged to come up and swap them out. And I did. He was just up in San Clemente, only about 40 minutes. And uh, we swapped them over. And then as I'm driving back, it's coming through this area. It's called Camp Pendleton. It's a big military base, so it's really wide open. It's quite pretty. And I was thinking, how come we couldn't keep boots in the warehouse for 24 hours? And the thugs warehouse, which was way bigger than our warehouse, is floor to ceiling, still packed with sheepskin boots. 
And it made me realise the power of the customer service that I'd done and the loyalty I'd built up from my customers over those last 10 years because I was always in there, I was always working their inventory. If it, you know, even if the owner wasn't there, I still treated that little piece of sheepskin shelf as my real estate and I made sure it was going to make money for them. And so the loyalty was, was unbelievable. And even though now today we're in a, a world of clicks and you know, Facebook pages and website pages and scrolling and, and you know, check out here, you must not lose contact with your customers, right? You've got to reach through that electronic system and figure out a way to touch personally your customers. And it's easy to do. I've, I've, I consult with a couple of girls who, who have different you know, product businesses and they have the most amazing rapport with their customers with little thank you notes and, and follow-ups and questionnaires. You know, th there's a way it can be done electronically. So I would urge you to do that because even though you know, it was pre-internet when I was doing this, this the the, the actual principles of sales and marketing have never, ever changed. Just the means. Okay. So, these are the four mantras. And again, you don't need to write them down. So those were sort of bummer stories, right? <laughs> Who'd like to hear a good one? Who, who believes in luck? I believe in karma, okay? What goes around comes around. You put the effort out, you'll get a return on it, both good and bad. So here we are now, we're, we're, we're doing probably 15, 13 million, and, and we've, we're huge in surfing, we're big in snowboarding and skiing. You know, I finally figured out that in, in Minneapolis, they don't read Surfer magazine, but they all play hockey. So I figured out how to get a marketing campaign going in all the hockey rinks and, and how to, all, you know, using young hockey players. And that worked for Back East as well. But there was no coherent image for UGG. It was just one product that had a whole bunch of different niches. And I decided, okay, I want to make a complete new change. And I came up with the term casual comfort. And the goal for me was to get launch casual comfort on the, fr on the page, the front page of the lifestyle section of USA Today. I'm sure you've all seen that, right? And the only way I could do that was to get a really good PR firm involved. And so I hired a company in Boston. I went up and worked with them for several weeks. And we put together a complete press kit. It was, you know, beautiful, beautiful glossy pages and photographs and samples of sheepskin. And it was just amazing. And we finished that and we went from Boston to New York to Philadelphia. And we worked our way city by city across to Chicago practicing this pitch because I had an appointment with Margaret who was the head of fashion for USA Today. The appointment was Wednesday afternoon at 3 o'clock. And we arrived at 5 to 3 and announced ourselves and Margaret comes running out going, oh, Brian, I'm so sorry. I've double booked. I have to be on a conference call at three. I've got five minutes. And I just thought, oh, shit. But, you know, again, good entrepreneur pivots. Um, I knew my presentation was at least a half hour long, so that was out. So I just reached down into my briefcase and I pulled up a, a tattered old file and it had all these little photographs in it, you know, that I'd been accumulating over the years. And uh, it was... It was all of these celebrities, you know, Neil Young and uh, all, you know, the rock stars that, that were out there, you know, a lot of Hollywood people, Brooke Shields. You know, I quickly flicked by that one because nobody wears Ugg boots in a red swimsuit on the beach, right? So I go to Heather Locklear and Margaret goes, go back, go back, who is that? So I give her this ad and she grabs it out of my hand and she wrote down the name of the photographer and the name of the London tabloid that, you know, a person had sent to me. And she said, do you have a press kit? Yep. Gone. Four minutes. And I looked at my girl who was uh, from the PR agency and I just said, we just blew. That was a $60,000 investment. Phew, gone. 
So the next morning I was uh, in Chicago O'Hare Airport getting a coffee on the way back to San Diego and I sat down, I got USA Today and I opened up through the you know, the front page and then the money section and I hit the lifestyle section and here's this amazing story that went on not only the front page but all of the second page was this whole expose on the shearling industry. She had researched sheepskin fabrics for you know the last 30, 40 years. She'd got trends. She had all of our competitors in there which pissed me off at first when I read it but but what happened is that when we were just one company, UGG, we were a product. Now we're a, we're a category within the footwear industry. And now all the mall stores that were so averse to us were coming in because they had to buy into the category because all the other mall stores. So this thing, even though it listed all of our competitors, it was the best thing that ever happened. And so that was uh, one of the greatest things that happened. Another thing that uh, was very lucky is that, and this is karmic, right? For, for five years, we'd been doing this girl from London a favor by shipping like 20 pairs of boots to all her friends. And it was a pain in the butt because we had to do a separate customs invoice for each one. It was just one pair at a time. So it cost us a fortune in freight and stuff. But we did it because it was Trudy Styler, who's the wife of Sting, right? So we wanted to be part of the cool crowd, you know? And so after five years of this one, she calls me Christmas and says, Brian, Brian, I've just been to a seminar. It's changed my world. I need a biggest favor. I need a perfect pair of size eight sand boots. And do you have a pen? I'll, I'll tell you where to sand them. And so I said, yep. She goes, Oprah care of Oprah Winfrey show Chicago. And that led to us being on Oprah's best picks for Christmas three years in a row, 20 minutes of nothing but Ugg. The elves were wearing Uggs. There were Uggs under the chairs for all of the people in the audience. She was raving about Uggs. And this is when Oprah was at her absolute peak of popularity in, in the, you know, the, the late uh, mid nineties then. And you couldn't have paid for that much advertising. And that's what, you remember I talked about Tadpole, Tadpole, Tadpole? This was the frog event for us because we'd been pushing and pushing and pushing. You know, got the business up to, you know, 10, 15 million dollars. And this is the one that blew it through the roof over the next few years. And uh, so, let me bring this, this full circle, right? Remember I started off with the guy with the tiles? Have you figured out any sort of reason why I would do that yet? So, in the footwear industry, the Bible is a weekly, uh, bi-weekly I think it is now, a magazine called Footwear News. And last year they had their 70th anniversary and they identified the 70 most influential people in the footwear industry in the past 70 years and I made the list. So I was really stoked about that, thanks. But why, why did that happen? Because remember I came to this country not knowing even what I was gonna do, I didn't even have a product in mind. So when I first started UGG, I had no idea about importing and, and uh, distribution of products. But after 18 years when I sold the company, I was importing sea containers, you know, three or four at a time every Christmas just to keep up with the demand. And I, I became really expert at warehousing and shipping. And uh, I knew nothing about footwear manufacturing. But by the end of the 18 years, we designed, I personally came up with designs for maybe a half a dozen shoes and my team had come up with a lot more and like so many colours, there were hundreds of combinations of stuff. So I became really, really good at footwear design. I knew nothing about the sheepskin industry, about tanneries, but you know, I eventually figured out how they could throw 
a skin into a vat of dye and the skin would come out dark chocolate brown and the fleece was white. And they could do the opposite. They could make the fleece chocolate and the skin white. So there were all these intricacies in the tanning process. I could tell when the boots arrived if that sheepskin had been in a wet season or a dry season just by the texture of the skin. You know, I became an expert in sheepskin. We were actually buying futures in skins, in lamb skins, before the lambs were born. And then we were buying futures in currency to make sure that we had the same price when we had to pay for them. Right? So I became an expert in all of that. Remember my first marketing efforts? Right? Woeful. I, I swear I turned more people off than I turned on with those models on the rocks, right? But I eventually became an expert in marketing because it, it, it's the image that I finally created after 15 years that was good enough for USA Today to take on and Oprah to take on. And it's that same image has not changed ever since I sold the company. So I became an expert in marketing. And when I started UGG, I had no idea about retail. You know, I didn't know the difference between big box and department store and specialty stores. And I figured out that and then, and then there were all these terms like keystoning, which means doubling the wholesale price and, and open to buys, which all the buyers is, you know, have as a budget. All this stuff that I had no idea about. I had to learn intricately on all of this stuff. And I eventually ended up playing golf with the president of Kinney Shoes, which back then was like the biggest retailer in the, in the, probably in the world, at his country club in New Jersey. So I'd gone from knowing nothing about retail to sort of hobnobbing at that level. And why? Because inadvertently I'd become the best at my little niche, right? I didn't, I wasn't into running shoes, I wasn't into tennis, I, I had my tiny little niche of sheepskin and I became the best in that niche. And so every one of you in this room has that same capacity to be the best at your little niche. It, don't look at your competitors and figure out how small you are or how much better funded they are. Or, I mean, keep your eye on them, but don't focus on what they're doing. Because if you can come up with another little part of your business that is better than what they do, is more efficient than what they do, is price competitive, there'll be all these sorts of things that'll come up that make you the best in your little niche. Okay? And that is what I want you to leave with from this talk. So thank you very, very much. Wasn't he fantastic? It's Brian Smith, Mug Boots.